So without um, further ado, I'm going to introduce Professor Dennis Sylvester. He is the Associate Chair for Electrical and Computer Engineering to get us started. Dennis. Thanks, Anne. Um, want to um, say hello to everyone. Um, my name is Dennis Sylvester, as Anne just said, um, Senior Associate Chair of, of Electrical and Computer Engineering in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And I'm here sort of on behalf of the chair of ECE, Ming-Yen Liu, to, um, to, to, to run this event. Uh, I'm really delighted to, uh, to welcome you to this fireside chat today with, with Ruba Borno, who is the recipient of our ECE Rising Star Award. So the Rising Star Award um, recognizes ECE alumni who have been very successful early in their career after graduating from Michigan. Uh, they're considered engineers to watch within the greater science and engineering community. And Ruba certainly fits into that category. Actually, we've been trying to give her this award for several years, um, but scheduling challenges and the pandemic kind of put a wrench in these plans. Uh, and and uh, But we're still very delighted to have her here today on Zoom so we could reach a, a big audience here. Uh, I have actually known Ruba for a long time because I had her in a class, I think 20 or so years ago when she was just starting her graduate program uh, at, at Michigan and I was kind of an early stage faculty. So, um, so Ruba is uh, currently the Vice President of Worldwide Channels and Alliances at Amazon Web Services. Uh, she leads a global team responsible for recruiting, enabling, buying and selling with over 100,000 companies uh, in more than 150 countries. So it's an enormous operation that she, that she leads and operates. Um, when we first gave her this award, she was in her previous position as Vice President of Growth Initiatives and Chief of Staff to the CEO at Cisco. So clearly you can see in just a couple of short years, um, we've, we've, she's already moving on to these bigger and, 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 and more influential roles. So it's, uh, uh, she's clearly deserving of this Rising Star Award. So we're gonna learn a lot more about Ruba uh, shortly in today's chat. Uh, but first I'd also like to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Ravi, Pensy. Uh, we've all received emails from Ravi whenever there's big changes in Michigan's IT services, um, especially uh, cloud-based services. Ravi, uh, Ravi's title is the University of Michigan Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer. So uh, I'm going to welcome Ruba and Ravi uh, once more and, and now begin the fireside chat. So Ravi, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Dennis, uh, thank you for the, those kind words and the introductions, greatly appreciated. And uh, Ruba, great to see you again, my friend. It's been a while, and I'm looking forward to getting. It has. To thank you, Dr. Pensy. <laughs> good to thank see you. you, and good to see Professor Sylvester. It has been a time, uh, a long time. I know he said a couple of decades. It's amazing. Uh, it does feel like just yesterday I was uh, walking the halls, working in the Lurie Nanofabrication Facility, taking classes, and then you know eventually defending my PhD. So thank you uh, for the time, and good to see you both. No, it's, 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 it has been an amazing journey for you, and we are so proud of all of your accomplishments. So congratulations again on your Rising Star Award, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. So shall we get started? Let's do it. Okay. I mean, you talked about uh, walking the halls here at uh, Michigan and uh, working in the labs and so on. So obviously, with your PhD in electrical engineering, now leading channels and alliances for AWS, Prior to that, I know how influential you were in Cisco and advising Chuck Robbins, who, by the way, says congratulations to you on your award. I texted with him, so he's uh, delighted for you, and uh, so many of your friends there are rooting for you, as always. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about your career path? Did you always wanted to pursue a leadership role, uh, going back to Michigan, and then now where you are today? Yeah, I'll, I'll go way back. Um, but I will say I, I love Ann Arbor and I know it's the start of a new semester and I always get so excited for students starting a new semester. It just feels like a fresh new experience. Um, and for me, it's because I really am motivated by learning. Um, I always wanted to do something new, de uh, develop myself, whether academically or professionally. And so if I look back on, on my career, both academic and professional, it's always been built on a foundation of, of developing new skills, or at least that's the, the major premise. Um, so I completed my PhD in the year 2008, <laughs> so it's been a while, um, in the Wireless Integrated Microsystems uh, uh, Research uh, Organization. And then as part of that, I worked in the Lurie Nan Nanofabrication Facility. And there were a lot of key things I learned. I mean, number one is just becoming an expert at something is really valued. I always give that advice to people. It set up a foundation for collaborating, for using a hypothesis-driven approach, uh, for communicating your concept and, and then testing it and making sure you can actually distill a message, find a use case, um, and then 
uh, move forward from there. And while I was in graduate school, I, I took some courses in the business school for fun because the business school was where I socialized. <laughs> um, and I wanted to think about commercializing my research. But I knew I couldn't do it without business training. And I will say after 10 years of electrical engineering, uh, it, academia and research, I could not continue to be in school. So I thought I'd get it in a practical way. Um, and that's what led me to the Boston Consulting Group, um, which is a management consulting firm. Um, and I'll, I'll go off an aside a little bit. My second project at the Boston Consulting Group um, was advising President Obama's task force for the automotive industry. And in this project, we had a matter of weeks to make a recommendation on whether the US government should invest um, to subsidize the automotive industry and subsidize the bailout. And it went from, gosh, a six plus year PhD to in less than six weeks deciding what to do with billions of dollars of taxpayers. It just showed me the difference in terms of how you can make really big decisions off of the best information you have at the time and just to keep using a hypothesis driven approach. So I will say that was a big aha moment for me is, is that particular project. Um, and then after that, I did go back to my tech roots and just focused on uh, enterprise tech and specifically enterprise tech uh, turnarounds. Um, and one of my clients was Cisco. Uh, and in 2015, uh, you'd mentioned Chuck Robbins. He was announced to take over as CEO from John Chambers who led the company for 20 years. Um, it was really a great opportunity. He invited me to join his leadership team, work on the growth strategy, serve as his chief of staff. Um, and there I worked at, on the company's strategy and what are the areas we want to invest in and how do we pivot the business model. Pivot from a net 30, so we sell, sell something to a customer, they, they pay us within 30 days and then we move on, to shifting to an as-a-service model, which everyone is familiar with. You know, Zoom is as-a-service, Spotify, other services they use. How do we shift to a recurring revenue model, which helps us maintain a longer-term relationship with customers? Um, from there, uh, I moved on to lead our customer experience centers organization. So my role there was to lead a team of 18,000 people globally to deliver technical support, managed services, professional services, customer success, and global supply chain and logistics to all of Cisco's customers around the world. Um, and that really stretched me in, in new ways. I mean, to go from, you know, I kind of skipped over a couple of steps here, but to go from individual work to then kind of smaller projects with the Boston Consulting Group where they were pretty contained projects um, to then being you know chief of staff and working on strategy, but a pretty contained team to then leading a, a you know an organization of 18,000 people across the globe in the middle of the pandemic. Um, it did definitely stretch me uh, as a leader, uh, but I loved it. I, I really learned a lot in terms of how do you influence and drive an organization? How do you set a vision? What do you measure? to be able to deliver results quickly. Um, and then from there, uh, I just joined AWS in November of 2022 uh, to lead the Channel Alliances organization. And now my, my scope has expanded in that I'm working with a, a partner ecosystem of over 100,000 partners across the globe. And here we're making sure that we're helping those partners reach AWS customers, expand the value that they deliver to AWS customers, um, and help them have successful businesses on AWS. And so I will say every time you, I kind of took a, a new change in role, um, I can probably say I knew about half of what I was doing and the other 50% was truly a, a learning opportunity and a development opportunity that leveraged some skills I had, whether it was strategy or operational excellence or leading large teams and then applying it in a new context. Uh, so it's uh, it's a pretty quick overview of, uh, of my career, but I think, I wouldn't say I planned it that way, but I do know that I've always optimized for learning. Now, what an incredible career it has been so far, and I know uh, more amazing things are gonna come your way and we'll be uh, waiting to read that story as well. But going back to the advice you provided to, to the Obama administration on the bailout, as you talked about, and that has worked out really, really well for Michigan. General Motors just today announced significant profits as a result of profit sharing with uh, all of their employees. So I'm sure 
uh, you, along with the Obama administration, had some hand in that. So congratulations. Well, to that as well. I was this this small part of it, but I will say one of my proudest moments was when um, John Stewart from The Daily Show. I don't know if people remember him when he was leading that show. He was reading the memos, and and there was one line in the memo that President Obama read that I contributed to. So that was that was great for me. That was my my feather in my cap. But it was obviously a great team effort, um, and you know I think uh, just something that I I enjoy talking about because people know about it. So it's. Uh, it's fun to talk about. No, no, that's great. And also shows uh, your humility when you are uh, continuously uh, uh, not talking about yourself and talking about a little part. You, all these, all the little parts add up to a big part. So congratulations again. Uh, you also talked about uh, as you moved from uh, different roles that uh, there were sometimes, you know, maybe you knew half of the business and the other half you had to learn on the go. So obviously there was some risk taking involved. So what advice do you have uh, to our students and all of us in terms of uh, taking some risks, maybe taking some calculated risks? So can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think number one, you've got to make a bet on yourself. <laughs> Uh, I think that's that's the number one thing is just evaluate if uh, if you're not going to take a risk on yourself, you're not going to take a bet on yourself. It's it's going to be really hard to uh, to be able to do that in any other context. And I think that that is something that um, I've always felt confident. That's why I said the 50 50 half of every role I've ever done. I felt very confident I could do, um, you know, and I could rely on that. And then that gave me the space and time to take a bet on myself to learn uh, the other 50 percent. Um, and so from there, I think there are a couple of things that I'd, I'd love to uh, share in terms of what allowed me to, to evolve, if you will, that way, and, and how it allowed me to actually have more, more confidence in my leadership. Um, I think as a, as a graduate student, you know, you start off with a hypothesis and asking questions, and some of that is advisor-led and, and faculty-led. Your committee helps you um, shape those questions, but then your job is to, to know the answers. <laughs> your job is to go really, really deep and and you know, test things with a, a tremendous amount of rigor um, and, and truly become, you know, the expert, the person who has all the answers about this, this one thing. Um, and I think that one of the things that I learned shifting from, let's say, an individual contributor to a leader, and it was a shift for me, is shifting from having all the answers to asking the right questions and, and guiding. Um, and, and that was tough because uh, I remember the very first time I became a manager, um, I tried to micromanage someone who is incredibly talented, and it was not sustainable for me from a work-life perspective. It was not sustainable for that individual because I was stifling their creativity. Um, and then they kept waiting on me. We weren't moving as fast as we could. And then one day I just stopped and I, I started asking questions and aligned on the outcome instead. Um, and the outcome since then has, has just been, was much better. And this was Years ago, this is literally the first person I managed outside of academia and is, is now on my team actually at AWS. So she's been working with me for a very long time. Um, but I've learned also in that that um, it's, it's great to value the intellect and what others bring to the table on your team. And so take advantage of that. I don't have to have all the answers. I have a team that surrounds me that complements my knowledge or my skills. Um, and so it's good for me for us to align on an outcome and a goal and then how we get there, it, definitely there's room for creativity. Um, the other thing that I think was a risk, and I mentioned kind of shifting from working in small groups to a really large organization, um, and how do you kind of influence organizations at that size? Um, I think that, and, and now kind of shifting to not just influencing people that, are, that report to me <laughs> in my organization, but also those in our, our broader community. Um, and, I learned a lot about how do I put myself in other people's shoes and empathize with them in order to make sure that I'm driving to outcomes that are mutually beneficial. Uh, and that's really important, whether the individuals report directly to you, they're part of a broader organization, or they're part of a, a part of a broader ecosystem, um, being able to empathize and understand what motivates them and drives them and then aligning on those shared goals. Um, is really important. And it was a big shift for me because I was used to, again, kind of coming in. I come in, I have the answers. We've got all the data. We've got a logical discussion. Boom, let's make a decision. You actually have to kind of go slow to go fast. And maybe that's the, the last kind of learning for me. Um, and, and it was a, a big learning is just how do I make sure that I do take the time to build in those foundational elements, whether it's relationship, whether it's taking the time to understand what is it that they care about um, in order to be able to move uh, a lot faster? So I think that 
there, those are kind of like three key lessons, not only in terms of taking a risk, but where do you apply it? Apply it for shifting from knowing the answers, which you've got to prove you can do. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, Michigan education definitely trains you to do that. Shifting from kind of getting things done on an individual basis to kind of leading at scale. And then don't be afraid to go slow, to, to go fast, especially when trying to have an outsized impact at scale. No, I think uh, th those are great points, Ruba. And uh, frankly speaking, at the University of Michigan, sometimes uh, uh, all higher education institutions sometimes uh, are accused of doing things slowly, but we do it very thoughtfully and we do, do it very collaboratively. So there's a lot of discussion that occurs here. But in the end, we get it right. And and we have also learning from leaders like you, we have also learned to go fast while uh, generally taking our time. So, so great advice. And one of the things I loved about what you said was about betting on yourself. You know, So that's a great advice to our young people who are betting on themselves and really asking the right questions and uh, trusting your team. So, so terrific advice on all of those uh, areas. One other question I had was obviously with this award, and I know you personally for a very long time, uh, you have accomplished so many incredible things. Uh, so, but when you look back at your career and you started referring to that, when you gave the example of the Obama White House, uh, what are some of the things that you're proud of? And if you could go back in time, is there anything you would do differently? Oh, big question. <laughs> Let me, I'll actually give you one example um, of, of something that's pretty recent. And I'm, I'm sure everybody's sort of over discussing the pandemic, but it came at a time that was a pretty pivotal moment for me career-wise. And I'm, I'm really proud of how I handled that and how my team handled that. Um, so in February of 2020, that's when my role expanded to lead the customer experience centers for, for Cisco. And one month later, we all know what happened. <laughs> Everyone uh, you know, was sent home um, and we had to help a bunch of our customers immediately uh, work on their digital transformations. Um, and my team was, was actually pretty unique at Cisco. Cisco had always had a hybrid working model. We had always been using a technology called WebEx. Um, and But the, the team that I led was used to being in the office. It was a very kind of apprenticeship model um, where they would support customers, especially the technical support team, which was about half of my team. Um, they were used to being in the office together. And when a customer would call in or, or send in a note with a challenge, they would immediately uh, work in teams to help solve the customer challenge. So one month into the job, completely the business model, the way that we delivered um, our services to our customers completely fell apart. And I will say before I took that role, every stakeholder I interviewed with said, we're really excited about you taking on this role, Ruba, but don't screw up technical support. <laughs> and I was like, got it, I'll leave it alone. Um, and here, you know, it was completely taken out of my hands that the, the entire model was, test, uh, was uh, tested. So not only did we have to make it work for them to, to work from home, which we used our technology and, and got it done, um, but we also had our volume had over tripled because we had decided as a company to give free WebEx licenses and security licenses to customers who needed security protection and needed ways of virtual collaboration. Um, so now all of those customers needed support and we immediately, I had the same set of engineers, but three X the support. Um, and one of the risks I took um, was I just asked my team sourced crowdsourced innovation because all of my engineers had something kind of cool hiding in their, their desks and their laptops that they were using to make their jobs easier. Just crowdsource what they were. Some of them I understood and others, I really had no idea what was going on. I said, just launch it. We have such a high volume that we'll know if it worked or didn't work pretty quickly. We'll measure customer satisfaction, we'll measure customer impact, and we'll apologize <laughs> when it didn't work. Um, and if it worked great, we'll scale it. Um, and we launched so many innovations just in the first few weeks that we were actually able to increase customer satisfaction to reach an all-time high every single quarter um, for two years. <laughs> so the full two years there, as a, and I think automation really helped with that, but it was crowdsourcing innovation. But what allowed the team members to do that was I told them I, it was on me. I had ultimate accountability. I told them if it worked, it, it's, it's, it's your, your uh, innovation and we'll give you credit. If it doesn't work, I'm the one who approved it and allowed it to go out there in the wild. Um, and that ultimate accountability, I think, really empowered the team to think creatively and, and just deliver to our customers. Um, we also did a bunch of other things that were innovative at the time. We asked for volunteers from the company to, to help support our customers. We had 
over 1800 engineers raised their hand to volunteer to support customers. I was honestly expecting just a few dozen. Um, and that's how, and we were able to train them. We took a three month curriculum and trained them in, in one week. So super proud of, of how my team innovated and just, you know, frankly, proud of what I was able to do in terms of being ultimately accountable and, and taking a bet on myself that I, I had enough confidence to believe that it was, we had the, the way to measure if it was going to work or not, but it was really ultimately on me. Um, and my job was to empower my people um, to deliver uh, an amazing uh, body of work. So it all comes down to people. It's a, it's a long way of answering that my, the thing I'm most proud of is, is the people that I've worked with um, that I've enabled to reach a potential that they otherwise didn't think they could. I will say the whole technical support team at Cisco did not think we were going to be able to deliver on 3x the workload overnight. Um, and they did, and they delivered to the highest customer satisfaction uh, measurements ever recorded in the company consistently, and it kept going up. That's amazing to me. I can go to someone currently on my team um, who created her own job. She was doing such a fantastic job at leading a, as one of my business partners, a functional business partner at AWS. And I was asking her, what are you really passionate about? And she said she was very passionate about empowering young women, especially those who um, immigrated from Africa, she's African, those who are victims of sex trafficking, those who didn't have an education and, and needed an opportunity to, to have a career. And I just said, well, we can do that. We have a lot of partners who need amazing talent. We have incredible curriculum at AWS to help people build cloud skills, which is still very high in demand job um, across the world. Why don't we bring those two things together? And now she leads a function for me of community impact where we are skilling individuals, working with our partners and investing in helping skill people and then translating those to jobs. This is a job she thought she wasn't gonna be able to do. It's a job she thought that she was gonna to have to work at AWS, retire, and then get on the board of a nonprofit and then do it. But now it's just part of her job. Um, and I think as a leader, it's really important to know what uh, your people want, what they're excited about, and then help them reach that and help them achieve uh, their potential. No, I think uh, that's great. And um, you alluded to before, as we were having conversation, uh, you talked about empathy and empathetic leadership, and that was tested, obviously, during you know the COVID timeframe that you talked about. Uh, and uh, you just now also mentioned about empowering your employees to do, do their very best and creating opportunities for them. So using that as a leverage starting point, can you talk about some of the important leadership attributes that you stand by and uh, how, they may have been, how they may have been tested or applied? And you already started the conversations on that, or let's go there. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think there's really four of them, and I, I guess I've probably talked about all of them, but I'll, I'll summarize them because they're sort of four key takeaways. Um, the first is empathy. I mean, you've got to know where people are coming from to help them go in a certain direction. Uh, there was a board member uh, at Cisco who used to say, where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit in an organization or where you sit. Um, and, and I think that's really true. Uh, understanding where someone is coming from, helping guide them in a certain direction. Uh, I, I think that I have to constantly ask myself, do I know where my stakeholders are? Uh, do I understand where they're coming from before I even uh, approach any kind of conversation with them in, in any way, shape or form? And this is, goes across the board, whether it's my management, whether it's my leadership team, skip levels I have in the organization, customers and partners that I speak with. Um, the second is, is emotional intelligence. And, and what do I mean by that? It is self-awareness, uh, knowing what I'm good at, what, where I have areas for development, and then the same about the individuals I work with because you've got to be self-aware and surround yourself with individuals who will complement that in order to deliver the best outcome. Um, the third thing is resiliency. I think, uh, you know, leaders are constantly tested. Uh, frankly, uh, individuals, I mean, we're, we're humans. We are constantly tested. I think the past few years have been testing us on a pretty regular basis. Um, can you bounce back from, from times of challenge and adversity? Can you lead through volatility and be the stabilizing force in, in those times? Um, can you take risks uh, and, and manage uh, those risks in a, in a deliberate manner, in a, in a calculated manner, um, uh, it, you know, in a, in a, let's say, calculated risks that don't, that are not um, foolish, let's say. They're calculated risks that, you know, there's a high risk, uh, high risk, but high reward outcome. Um, and then the last piece, uh, I mentioned that earlier with the example I gave when I first took on my, my last role, is taking accountability. 
uh, I think it's it's important to give credit where credit is due. When things succeed and when when ideas uh, do come to fruition, um, it's important to give credit to the team. Um, but it's also really important to be accountable for when things go wrong. Um, so if the actions that we take don't work, uh, I assume the blame. If they do, the team gets the accolades. But ultimately, you know, you are the leader. You're accountable. So it doesn't it doesn't matter. It, it, it does. You can't blame someone else. You've got to just demonstrate a deep level of accountability. Um, and in order to do that with credibility, you've got to have some depth. Go into details on the content. Understand what's going on. Be intellectually curious. Um, in order to, to take accountability appropriately, you've got to know what you're you're holding yourself accountable for. And I think that that allows and empowers the, the team to actually produce a lot more. Well, that's such terrific advice. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to see if, uh, go to Dennis and see if he can ask some of the audience questions. So Dennis, over to you, and then I'll come back with a few more questions. Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to um, ask a question that came through the RSVP forms. Uh, we got a handful of those questions. And one of the ones that I thought would be, you know, interesting to a lot of the students is about early stage decisions. Say you're a senior undergraduate student, or maybe you're entering graduate school, or you're trying to make a decision about what degree to go for. Should I go into industry sooner? Is a PhD useful for certain things? And all of those types of questions that I'm sure that you know a lot about Ruba, you run a huge team, you made your own decisions uh, when you went for your PhD, but um, you've seen many other uh, of your employees and, and what they you know, got out of their degree. So what kind of advice would you give to students that are trying to make decisions about grad school, master's, PhD, straight to industry, et cetera? Um, it, it's a good question. I will say there's no right or wrong answer to this. So I'm sure that's not gonna be satisfying for some folks, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a framework of how I think about it. Um, so number one, and I, I, I said this kind of at the beginning in terms of how I've always thought about my career and, and it also in academia, um, it is invest in your growth. The, the only thing that stays with you is, is your own learning and, and your own skill sets. So invest in those. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a refugee. I came to the United States. Uh, my family came as refugees. We came with nothing. The only thing that my parents had was their education. So any money they built, any businesses they built, that went away instantly. And all they had was their education. So investing in your own growth, investing in your own skill set and optimizing for that is a worthwhile investment. And that's ingrained in me. And it's what I've always prioritized. And and I think that's, that's why I kind of pushed forward to uh, go to graduate school, get a PhD. It's why I, you know, have constantly pursued uh, roles where I got a chance to learn on the job consistently. Um, so I think to me, that's that's the best investment you could make. Um, and I kind of position that maybe in contrast to, you know, a job right now that'll pay you, uh, you know, immediate money, but then it's compromising a long term. So it's taking a long term view and an investment in yourself. That's that's how I've I've always thought about it, and it's it's paid off well for me. Um, but I also had circumstances that allowed me to do that. So, so you definitely have to take into account your own circumstances at the time. Um, the, the second thing is, you know, think through the objectives that you have. And I, I did say take a long-term view, but when I set goals, I, it's really hard to set super long-term goals for oneself. Um, I would think out kind of two to three years out, this is what I have built expertise in. These are the areas that I want to build some expertise in or demonstrate credibility in. So I'll, I'll give one example. When I was going from uh, being Chuck Robbins chief of staff to moving to CX centers, I had demonstrated both at the Boston Consulting Group and at Cisco strategy. I had demonstrated some operational excellence. I had demonstrated technical depth and the ability to speak with customers like Dr. Pensy um, and being able to work with them on, on what matters to them. I knew that for my next role, I wanted to leverage all of those skill sets but I also really wanted to be stretched on leading a large organization. That was very important to me because I had not gotten to do that in a decade of, of being in the professional world. I had always led smaller teams. So that was an important objective for me. Um, there are other examples kind of throughout my career where I made kind of similar trade-offs um, or thought through what is the next thing I want to learn. But put that down for yourself. I mean, I'd encourage you to just take a piece of paper. <laughs> what have I demonstrated? What am I good at? What do I need to demonstrate it, demonstrate and get good at? Um, and then the last thing I would say is spend a lot of time articulating, thinking about and articulating your thoughts. So how do you communicate uh, to others? 
This is really important whether you are in graduate school. I think I underinvested in my communication skills in academia. I feel like I got a lot better at that um, when I went to BCG. Um, but I, I wrote a blog a couple of years ago uh, on this framework that I learned from what a senior partner at BCG called the no feel do model, which is before I go into any conversation with any stakeholder. So whether it's a mentor who I need to ask for advice on what to do with my career, um, my boss or a customer, um, I think through what do I want them to know? How do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do? And that has helped me articulate my questions to myself. So when I went to, to my boss to talk about what my next role should be, by actually spending time to go through the no field do, it helped me synthesize what are the most important attributes of that. So I'm kind of sharing, I guess, a framework of how each person can come up with it on their own. Um, but again, it's invest in yourself, uh, think about the objectives and then communicate. And I, I love the no field do method as a way to kind of synthesize down um, what you really want to achieve. I think uh, that's a great point. So continuing our conversation, uh, uh, you know, Ruba, you know, I'm sure you've heard of chat GPT and all the interesting AI tools that are out there, facial recognition and on and on. You know, technology can do a lot of things and powerful things. But obviously, we have seen some examples recently of high ranking tech leaders come under fire for failing to address the negative consequences of tech. Sometimes there are challenges with the technology that one rolls out. So, and you've been on, on, at some of the top companies and you've been at one of the top consulting groups with Boston Consulting. So what lessons uh, have you taken from your journey that allow you to be a better steward of the company's inventions? Yeah, I think we have a, a leadership principle at uh, Amazon. So it's across all of Amazon, not just Amazon Web Services. Um, and it's called success and scale brings broad responsibility. And I love that leadership principle because it grounds us in exactly what you're saying. We are accountable um, to be better for our communities, for our planet, and for future generations. So I fully believe that in the technology industry, we have a responsibility to build a better uh, build a better world um, and to give back to the communities in which we live. And it's it's not just a responsibility; it's actually also good good for business. Um, so. There are a couple of things, and I would say this isn't just something that has started recently. Um, several years ago, uh, with the World Economic Forum, I worked with the IT industry um, a group of CEOs on what's an initiative that we should work on together. And the initiative that, that we worked on together was to actually close the tech skills gap. So all of these technology CEOs came together and said, our automation has a you know has a lot of benefits in the world reducing costs being able to do things quicker more innovation but it also has some potential negative implications of displacing individuals out of jobs automating uh, jobs that used to be uh, manual and so we then said well, how do we turn that into an opportunity and when you look at technology one of the greatest barriers to success is the availability um, of technical talent, specifically cl cloud computing and security. I mean, those are two areas with, with negative unemployment. Um, so we definitely still have, you know, we've got a supply in, in individuals who maybe are potentially being displaced and demand in these roles. Um, so I spent time with the, the group of IT leaders to think through what are each of the initiatives that their companies are going to be doing to close the skills gap. Um, Cisco had always had the Net Academy or Networking Academy, um, and I think by the time I left, it had already trained over 12 million people um, globally. Um, at AWS, uh, several years ago, our CEO, uh, Andy Jassy, committed to providing free cloud computing skills to training 29 million people by 2025. We're already over halfway um, to that goal. Uh, and so turning the idea and the thought into action. Uh, and I think that that's something that we should hold leaders accountable to doing. Um, last year at, at uh, the AWS conference reInvent, I had on stage join me the CEO of an organization called Escola de Nuvem, which means cloud school in Brazil. Um, it's an organization that was founded by 14 of uh, AWS's partners in Brazil who came together and they realized they had a tech uh, gap. They needed skills. They went specifically to second cities, to cities with favelas train those individuals in a two and a half month curriculum, and then put them through a job uh, a job discovery program. So actually getting them a job, and then they hired half of them and the other half went to customers. 
And I had a student on stage and several students uh, in, virtually joining uh, through video um, that had gotten jobs out of this and their lives had changed. They went in two and a half months from making some amount of uh, money to 5X that just through this, this skills training. And so it shows it's possible. It just requires a commitment. It's not easy, it requires focus. It does require sponsorship from the top. And these are the stories that, that get me excited. And I think that we should hold um, leaders accountable to keep uh, delivering on these types of initiatives. Um, the other piece is, is sustainability. And I think this is a topic that um, comes up more and more. Of course, Europe and, and Asia have been dealing with this a lot uh, more recently than the United States. Uh, but making sure that we are holding ourselves accountable to energy efficiency, to being carbon neutral, to being water positive. Um, and I'm really encouraged by how the tech industry is putting goals out there. Like at AWS, we've got several goals um, out there and including putting out the climate pledge where we're bringing uh, the ecosystem of companies together to support sustainability. Um, but I, I mean, I think we've got to have our customers, our customers and our partners do hold us accountable. Our employees hold us accountable. Um, and then we've got to actually measure what we say we care about. I think um, that those are great points. And um, at Michigan, for example, my team and our, my extended IT team has taken advantage of Amazon's cloud computing uh, courses. And so we actually have trained the trainer model. There are several on my team who are certified and they are now teaching across our 2,300 IT professionals across the campus uh, holding classes and some of the Amazon offerings. So just so you know. So That's you're awesome. Planning, Great to hear. You know, yeah. So we, we can talk offline more about that. But really one other important thing I wanted to ask you about, and I know, the, you know, mental health and wellness overall is a focus for you and focus for all of us. So can you talk a little bit about uh, how you take care of your own mental health and wellness as you, uh, you know, literally working 24 seven, seven across all over the world, uh, taking care of things. Well, I don't work 24 seven. So that's probably the Good. first thing I'll say. And, and I think that was a shift for me, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it, in, in graduate school and even into to BCG, I think it was sort of a badge of honor to pull all nighters and, and work nonstop. Uh, and it did take a toll on my health. Uh, I was, you know, I, I wasn't physically fit. I certainly was not prioritizing exercise. I was definitely not prioritizing sleep. Um, but I noticed that as my scope uh, expanded, I really did need to take time for my physical health and my mental uh, well-being to be able to handle the context switching, to be able to handle the amount of things I had on my plate. I think when when my responsibility was just narrow, it was easy to kind of burn the candle on both ends. Um, but then when it, it got a broader scope and decisions I made impacted, let's say, 18,000 employees or 100,000 partners, and it was just massive implications, uh, and, and the, the consequences became much bigger, um, I actually had to prioritize my, my physical health and, and my mental well-being. And so, number one, uh, working out is non-negotiable. Um, it, it has to happen. And the second thing that's non-negotiable really is sleep. Um, I, I definitely would used to deprioritize sleep. I would even choose working out over sleep. Um, and now I, I, I've got to sleep because I've, I've got to, to make sure I'm of, of sound mind uh, to make these decisions. And I think once I prioritized those two things, it sounds really simple, but I did not do that until my late thirties. So it took me a really long time <laughs> to, to make these really important changes. Um, and so that's why I, I say them. I, I know people hear leaders say them all the time. I used to roll my eyes when I'd hear Ariana Huffington talk about it. Um, but it is true. Like when, when, you're, when your purview expands and, and the implications of what your decisions are are broader, um, it's really important to do that. I think the other thing is take some time to kind of step away from it all. Um, I try to climb a mountain per year. Um, and that's a really good moment to kind of be with myself, be with my thoughts, a few nights on a mountain, um, recognizing how small I am compared to the vast universe out there. Uh, and, you know, you can't be connected. So that's uh, also a really good, uh, good time to disconnect, but find your, your own way to disconnect, um, you know, a couple of times a year. And it's, it's a good way to reset uh, and, and reevaluate. I think a lot of good advice there, especially around uh, sleep and working out uh, to, to all our students and all of us as well. So thank you. So just, you know, a lot of great information, but just to summarize quickly, you know, uh, betting on yourself, asking the right questions, uh, not micromanaging, aligning on the outcomes, uh, you know, that empathetic leadership, leading with EQ, resiliency, accountability. So there are just so many golden nuggets in this conversation. And then we could talk 
for hours, but unfortunately we are right on time. So I'm gonna invite uh, Dennis to come on camera and wrap this up for us. Ruba, thank you so much. Uh, this has been fun. And I'll of course contact you offline and we can chat more. Dennis, over to you, please. Thank you, Ravi. Yeah, thank you, Ravi. That was a phenomenal recap actually of all of that conversation. You, you take really good notes. So uh, you, you were probably a great student back in the day too. Um, so I just wanted to um, thank everyone for coming. Uh, and I hope you all found this conversation as uh, beneficial as I did, and you enjoyed the chat with uh, with Dr. Ruba Borno and uh, Dr. Ravi Pensi. Thank you, Ravi, for moderating today's session. Uh, thank you, Ruba, so much for being here today, uh, taking the time, representing Michigan and ECE so exceptionally. Uh, we really appreciate that. We're very proud of you uh, and wish you all the continued success. Um, so just gonna uh, wrap it up and, and say thanks, everyone. Thanks, Professor Sylvester. Thanks, Dr. Pensy. Thank you. Go blue. Go blue. <laughs> Go blue. Take care.